We motion please to approve the agenda moved by our office. Discussing the agenda. All in favor? Opposed? Agenda is approved. We motion please approve the minutes moved by Austin Iyer. Discussion? In favor? Opposed? Minutes are approved. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. Last year, you recall we went through our victim of weather situation um, in the heat of the moment, so to speak. We jumped in and we set up an uh, impromptu shelter. We struggled mightily to do it. We didn't really have the resources to do it. We were asking the wrong people to do it. We were having people work on it. We needed to be doing other things, but we just needed to get through the season. When we did that, I asked the team to take the summer to fully investigate uh, what options there might be, what partners there might be, so that before the winter struck again, we would sort of all know here's what our capabilities are, here's what we would need to work on. And so Chief Kennedy is here simply to share with you the results of he and our emergency manager and the team, what they've done over the past couple of months. Thank you. Um, so uh, Sydney Parmenter is our uh, emergency manager. Um, she would have been here today, uh, yesterday, today, tomorrow is the Michigan Emergency Manager Conference and she sits on that board, so she is there, so I am. <laughs> so you get me instead. So, um, uh, but we, we've been working hand in hand with this, and so I'm uh, confident to answer any questions. And obviously, if there's any follow up, uh, or I can can work on that. Um, so I know it's been a, a busy year with storm events. <laughs> so the one that triggered this was the first ice storm. So we kind of we had the ice storm, and then two weeks later we got hit with the the snow on top of that with the ice storm is where we really had the significant power outages and then the other concern was the below freezing temperatures. Um, when uh, uh, Sydney, when we realized that we were probably going to be looking at a shelter scenario, the prior city plan pointed to the American Red Cross and that was also what the Washtenaw County Emergency Management Plan pointed to was the American Red Cross. Um, I could go in detail, probably better offline. The Red Cross, when we called them, basically said, you're on your own. Good luck, which was not helpful in the middle of a true crisis. Um, so working with that um, through some Herculean efforts and, and huge credit to Dr. Stoltz and um, uh, Mrs. Parmenter for their work on this, we were able to pull off a shelter. The big issue with this, as Mr. Dahoney alluded to, is especially with Sydney, her efforts were literally with trying to get cots and very in the weeds type stuff. And we really needed her to be looking at big picture city stuff. Um, but there was truly no one else kind of to do it at the time. And, and so they, they, they made it work. Um, once the uh, kind of the, the emergency was, was over with that, um, is, and so I, I apologize. There's a handout. The handout really gives a lot of the thorny details. I, I'll, I'll kind of be covering some of that, but if you really want like dates and times and in specific, that that's in that that handout for you. I'll be kind of doing a, a higher level review. Um, we we also used a lot of city staff as part of that. Um, upon kind of some reflection with that, and my understanding with. Um, the HR director and I think the city attorney's office was involved. Several of those staff were in bargaining units. And so then we kind of had to go back and figure out pay and compensation. And with overtime and bargaining units, I, I think they were able to work it all out, but it wasn't great. <laughs> so I'm realizing that there's a better way to do this. We need to figure out, <laughs> we need to figure out a better way to do this. Um, and so then we, in, in mid-March, we, we received a, um, kind of the marching orders from Mr. Dahoney of the, the, the Red Cross plan, we didn't work, we need to figure out what we want to do. Um, so with that, and it was really with um, Mr. Delacord, um, Dr. Stoltz, Sidney, myself, kind of were the, the working group on this, um, reached out to 
anyone in the community that we remotely thought would be a partner on this, interested in this, try to make the tent as big as possible, invite everybody, see, see, who, see who was interested. Um, at the bottom of the page is everyone who was reached out to, and those were people that had, through a variety of sources, either during COVID were part of sheltering or through normal kind of unhoused shelter discussions. Um, so that was all who was invited, and then the, um, the, the bolded is, is who attended. As we worked through this, um, everyone kind of started to fall off because this is sheltering. This isn't real easy. It's like basically you're on standby and then at a pretty much of a moment when it's notice, we need you to turn things on and, and help us with sheltering. As we work through this process, um, uh, Community Action Network CAN is the one that really came up and said, hey, we have the vulnerable population. Our, our normal clientele are the ones that aren't going to be able to just pull out a credit card and stay at a hotel or have means to go somewhere else. Um, and so we've had a lot of conversations with CAN to say um, they're, they're, willing, they're, they're willing to basically have the conversation with the city of a potential partnership. Um, obviously, there's a current contractual relationship with the city, so they're, they're a known quantity. Um, we haven't gotten into financials or um, kind of a uh, contractual agreement. Um, we wanted to basically have this opportunity to, to bring this before this body. This is what we've done. Um, and if kind of depending on <laughs> what sentiments may be, we can go back to the drawing board or this sounds like a good idea. Um, whether it's CAN or someone else, no matter what, any proposal is going to come with a funding request. That funding request is going to be um, really for a couple of things, uh, one of which being kind of like the cops themselves, and that's one thing we really didn't settle on is would kind of CAN have a trailer, and if it's on the south side and like Bryant, we could take the trailer there. If it's on the north side, we could take it up there. Um, so there, there's kind of the simple, like the physical parts of running a shelter. And then there's the, with CAN of, hey, there's probably a, some sort of baseline annual retainer that the city would pay. And then for every activation hour, and these are just kind of some models we saw across the country of a potential way of, of doing this. Um, again, have not had any agreement with CAN on this. Um, I would see this being probably five figures. I don't see this being six figures. And that's just me using very, very rough, <laughs> rough math, but just so you kind of have an idea of, of where where this is at. So uh, Mr. Dahoney, if there's a couple of things just to touch on. So last year, um, what we essentially said to the staff we know your job description doesn't call for what we're asking you to do. We know you're in need, et cetera, et cetera. We're in a state of emergency. Um, we said, forget all that. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, so that's what people did, but still, it's not. What we also found when we got into it is the opportunity for partnerships seems to be very limited. There's not a cast of thousands of agencies out there that either willing or have capacity to help us do this. Part of the challenge is a number of these agencies have staff that live outside Ann Arbor, and if you're in the middle of a snowstorm, you can't get to where we need you to be. So that's no help. Uh, so that further limits uh, kind of you know, what our options uh, might be. And then the final point is, if we choose to go forward and create some kind of a framework, we will have to develop a clear set of triggering thresholds 
because it can't just be activating because it's snowing outside. It's got to be a clear, it's either it's got to be at this level before the trigger gets hit. And then once it, the trigger gets hit, you're still looking at X amount of time before people can get in place to actually do what it is we're asking. So those are the things that we're willing to work through. Um, but as the Chief Kennedy said, we had to come to you today just to see this is the path you want us to go down because the alternative is this thing to the community sheltering is not an element of city response that you should be expected. City government proper is not able to do that. We'll do a lot of other things, but not that. question. Um, so to back up to the Red Cross partnership, um, I can't remember from the memo, it sounds like there was a triggering event for them of it had to be X amount of hours before they could be willing to be engaged at like 72 or something right. like that. Yeah. Is that like a, is that a national policy or is that a local policy, you know? So that's national. Um, they always want to be careful speaking for another organization. Um, their volunteer numbers throughout their organization have not recovered from COVID. It's, it's kind of a, a simple part of that. The 72 hours is part of their national framework because not through FEMA, big big picture federal <laughs> federal government, they also have some agreements on a national level with FEMA for sheltering. And the 72 hours is basically a multi, like a regional, like a multi-state response. Mm -hmm. So that's where that triggers so so there's basically no way to push push volunteer you know help with the volunteer recruitment for red cross they're 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 pretty strong in there okay and then um in terms of those who were reached out to um i'm noticing that peace neighborhood center wasn't included on this which i not everybody can be but i noticed that um, Peace Neighborhood is sort of the organization that often serves the vulnerable population on the west side of Ann Arbor and has a broader service area than that as well. But um, I would be curious moving forward if we're moving forward with CAN. I don't know if they've had conversations or if we've had conversations with you separately. Um, perhaps they can um, address the entire sort of service need that we would have across the community. Um, but if not, I would wonder if they would need to work in partnership with other organizations because. My understanding is can primarily services southeast side of Ann Arbor and beyond, but perhaps I'm wrong in terms of how this. So I, I know they manage Bryan and then also the north side. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then that's when we did have these conversations with the idea that it, and this is another kind of challenge for us is that this, that anything with CAN would be the intention of servicing the entire city. Um, We've already kind of started to work out, as Mr. Dahoney talked about, like what are what are the kind of the, the um, trigger points for this, and then what are um, some criteria like pets, and we we won't be able to deal with people with like medical oxygen, like this won't be a we won't have like skilled people there. So we've already kind of started to do a lot of research of if we were to get in the shelter business, a, a lot of especially coastal communities with hurricanes, we've reached out to them like. How do you guys do this? Um, uh, and then the other part is people outside the city that know that because the, the reality is we're probably going to have something functional in the rest of the county, like we won't. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in, in terms of the Peace Neighborhood, I... Um, they just operate the community center that's on the Western side. Gotcha. So, so have funding to service that sort of um, low-income corridor. So. And they're totally in the, I apologize for my sure. lack of knowledge, they are a separate thing from CAN, correct? correct. They're okay. a separate nonprofit okay. um, and often provide similar services in terms of, I think, <laughs> in terms of my understanding of organizational functioning. Um, gotcha. Operating okay. Different populations. And okay. Services. They are referenced as an invited organization. Third page, please. Oh, okay. Understand. Yeah, so that's kind of a separate. Um, there, there was an ask to provide kind of outside of shelter. What are we doing for separate resilience work? 
And that was just kind of an update of separate resilience work, which is certainly parallel to, but separate from the sheltering. So, no, thank you. What's the direction? What kind of snapshot on this? Is it something that we're going to be able to provide successfully in a way that can meet people? You need uh, an adequate number of people's needs. It depends on the severity of the incident. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever yeah. shelter we would be able to set up in partnership with care, everyone else will have a limited capacity. Once the capacity shifts, then we would have to message out that we're at capacity and so we don't have anything available. If the community's expectation is, you know, we have to just keep going, we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but there's a view from our side, it's almost a no win situation. Mm -hmm. If you don't do anything in this regard, people will say you're, you're not really fully responsible in the middle of an emergency. If you do it, but you say, well, we only have room for 15 or 25 or 35 people, then that's what we have room for. And beyond that, people are still unhappy. So then, you know, the city is getting criticism because the capacity is not what they thought it to be. Um, one of the items I ask the staff to think about, and, and they reject it and not support them, the simplest thing is to control a block of those homes and pay for it. Then you're not in the quote sheltering business. Some cities are building or buying vacant hotels and turning them into these kinds of facilities. We don't have that kind of money. But our staff did not support that, so and I'm with them. So now it's this kind of limited outreach or just uh, work on resiliency and getting people to be able to shelter in place regardless of the situation. And why does our, why does staff not support that? Well, it, it does create a whole level of logistics. So it, are you controlling the block of rooms year round? You know, not feasible? Are you controlling the block of rooms during the winter season when it's uncertain when you're going to need them? So it's being able to work through that and you know our emergency management section is person and a half. We still need Sydney to help run the emergency response. There's no one to take on the housing logistical element of running it. But the point is that option, even though it may be not as feasible, is an out for a city who's looking to do something but maybe not able to do it. Well, if the hotel's already there and they have the infrastructure already there and you paid X, but I don't know what X is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, well, no, um, so also in, in consulting with some other communities that do that, it um, runs into some, the idea of a shelter is to take care of like, so people don't be sort of thing. In a hotel room, um, turning in that off becomes a little bit more difficult. So that was kind of some of the, and then the other part too is, um, some other communities have experienced significant damage to private facilities that the municipality was then on, on the hook for. So th th those are kind of some two other somewhat granular, granular things that kind of help drive that decision. Yeah, I know at the county level, um, the hoteling programs are very, like, end up being very uh, expensive commitments and um, as expensive as like permanent Board of Housing is for individuals like the hoteling portion is actually more expensive. Um, they've calculated that out. I, I guess 
my question is in terms of the people who and I'm looking through the uh, report online and the number of people who took advantage of the shelter. So um, I guess it says that, you know, from in that first that February storm, 31 people at Northside, 20 people at Westgate Library, 10 people at the Lutheran Church. Um, and I had heard also that it, at a certain point it kind of tapered out because people were kind of coming in to the library and the different shelters to like charge devices, but preferring to stay at home. So this, you know, I think this goes to the question of like activation criteria, how many people we could expect. Do you guys have thoughts around that? You know, that you kind of did. was this storm kind of the worst case or, you know, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, as kind of the reports alluded to, um, I think that we are all in the midst of climate uh, incidents, <laughs> events that are unprecedented um, in the, I mean, uh, so we, I believe it was 21 when we had somewhat of a straight line wind event mainly affected the northwest side of the city. And either 20 or 21, I almost positive it was August of 21, that we attempted to do something at Pioneer High School. And that worked because school wasn't in, in session yet. Um, so prior to that, based on all the records that we had, the city hadn't attempted to do anything similar for at least 25 years. We're now within a three year, two year period. We just keep getting walloped with this. Um, I would say, especially because the, the freezing events are the, are the bigger issues, where I mean, you're truly dealing with like a health, health safety yeah. issue for people, not a convenience or a comfort issue. Um, it, it's hard to take one event and extrapolate, mm -hmm. but based on the population need that we saw for that, I think that we could at least expect that replicated for a similar cold weather event. I'm not sure if I, it, yeah. No, no, that, that, that makes sense. So um, thinking in terms of, you know, how many cots or how many spaces, something like 100, 200. Like, yeah, you know, and I guess to, to, to clarify, so for the, the libraries are fantastic for the ones that have power. They really kind of serve as like kind of warming shelters and for people to come in and charge electronic devices at none of the library locations where they're actually an ability for people to sleep. Oh, okay. So the, the, the sleeping accommodations were at the church and at Northside. Let, let's give that some call. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I, that, I think that was kind of ad hoc then. Yeah. So, but, yeah. but the libraries aren't set up for any sort of exactly. overnight, routinely set up for any sort of overnight thing. So, so one final question. Uh, final, but uh, additional question. Um, so, obviously, the the library is operated as the, the daytime sort of shelter. Yeah. Um, and I assume that they have not had an interest in getting into the overnight. Of course. They, they were. <laughs> <laughs> and, the occasion of Westgate that, that jumped in on the bus. Yeah, and I think some of it's also just kind of a space issue. Um, but And I can't stress what wonderful partners have been for all of this. Um, the other part, too, is um, in order for us to have anything that really is a shelter, there really needs to be emergency on light backup generation power. Mm -hmm. So that's also another, like we can, um, and I'm quite, the, the library, I don't want to say <laughs> certain on this, the library facilities that do have generator power is more meant for like life safety systems, not really meant to be fully functional, um, uh, a 24 seven fully, uh, building support generator system. So, so the higher level option. You know, if you accept that the weather patterns are going to continue to be unpredictable, and we're going to continue to experience certain level of severe situations, then it speaks to really banging the drum to the total community to take all the precautions you can't be ready because we never know when this is going to happen. 
So with, because you know there were people. Well, we don't have blankets, or we don't have flashlights. Or, I mean, those are things. That our reality is you got to have all that because if these things are going to continue, uh, we would never have the ability to shelter the whole city somewhere. You're going to have to. It's either a hotel or stay at home, and then we've got to cover for the people who are unhoused to the extent that we can do it. I just caution against really the political risk to elected officials by putting something out that has limited scope and uh, 30 people break from 30 is what when you get beyond that people be pretty angry. Mm -hmm. If we just say we're not in, we can't do shelters, we can't do shelters, then you're never expecting that you're going to be able to go to somewhere and be able to be in a shelter that we're running with city employees. And overnight. Yeah. Overnight. Is there a, uh, is there an asymmetry in the the, I mean, there's an obvious asymmetry in the ability of residents to uh, to deal with an event such as this, and can and the like um, provide service to uh, folks who are, you know, from a resource perspective, less able. Uh, are we able to count to provide service to that uh, community, and uh, are we able to provide service to that community? Uh, and not have it be a general application. Understanding the answers almost certainly no. Um, I guess to the point is, not sure if I answered your question. Well, Sorry, so, 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 can right now, sir, like uh, can has two these two neighborhood centers, the Geneva centers, focus on yes. the neighborhood. Yes. Um, now they, they they don't focus on other neighborhoods. Uh, is that a point of entry? Um, so a lot of the other, and again, kind of that parallel resilience work that OSI and emergency management are working on. Um, I, I know for Brian, that, um, there's the battery backup power, and I believe they're at 48 hours now in terms of a like mm -hmm. battery system. Northside has the solar, uh, and I do know that um, for Peace Neighborhood, that is or is on the short list of next uh, um, next locations to get basically kind of like on the uh, yeah the, you know, <laughs> correct the, the doctor's so special so yes um, yeah <laughs> really, you know, yeah <laughs> yes, sir. the resiliency hub so those are so those those have, have been identified as us trying to exactly to your point make sure that the, the, the ones that are doing the day-to-day -day service that we're standing those up as, as much as we can. And um, I know it, it, uh, little as, or excuse me, as recently as last week, having conversations with Dr. Souls about those resiliency hubs, so. And just also kind of like calibrate what we're talking about, like this is really just sort of focusing on our ability to provide overnight, uh, like we can provide shelter it just was not open up. Correct. We can provide shelter, we can provide warming, we can provide, you know, heat and phones and you know the location we go to during the day and maybe even for extended periods. But the bottom line of what we're talking about is open. Correct. And and that's where you, you run into a lot of other logistical challenges just with kind of cots and training of staff. And as Mr. Dehonian mentioned, there's a lot of other kind of can you can't bring your and medical needs and just there's a lot of other things that we can also be friction points and as we've talked with a lot of other communities that you know, people come in with their whatever <laughs> emotional support alligator down in Florida and, and Florida is a, a community that has done a lot of this and we we've, we've been able to tr learn a tremendous amount from them of these are kind of the tough paths that you're going to go down and they've really all said like You've got to, this is your activation criteria. You, you, you have to stick to that because once you start 
deviating, it, you really open yourself up. So. Yeah, you probably just, you know, some of the questions that came up the last time around, and we just went with the flow. So there were a lot of questions like acceptance criteria, um, responsibility of personal belongings that are being brought in, um, co-ed or not. Um, so all these, if you're going to have an actual program, those questions will have to be forethought and, you know, answers available if there's a program. Sorry, I came in late and I see Washington County Health Department is on the list, but to what extent have we had conversations with the county? Um, because my understanding, I think, in last speaking with the commissioner was they're actually still holding on to hotel rooms or a hotel space, even from, I think, COVID. Um, and so I wonder if there's opportunities to really collaborate with them. That was my understanding from a conversation with one person. Um, but perhaps I was wow, misunderstanding that. Um, so throughout the process in February, um, there was there was basically con continual communication with the, the city emergency management and the county emergency management. Both of us had in our plans the Red Cross was was to go to, and Red Cross is the ones that said you're on your own. Um, in terms of and, and some of this, there becomes some overlap in terms of crisis. Like there, there's there, there's an incident, a weather event, power outage that causes this versus the daily need of the unhoused population, and there's a lot of <laughs> there's there's a lot of kind of crossover in in that space, and that's also kind of what um, some of the hotel challenges is what Mr. Dahoney brought up about some municipalities having a block of hotel rooms that that's, that the, the people that struggle with homelessness on a regular basis that quickly kind of comes into this conversation. Mm -hmm. There was a resistance there. Mm -hmm. what I, you know, I wonder whether what I'm hearing is, this is a service that we've not provided in the past. This is a service that we have looked at other jurisdictions for guidance. What we learned from looking at those other jurisdictions is that uh, absent a substantial investment, we're not going to be able to provide this, uh, this service uh, successfully to all but a handful of residents. Mm -hmm. And if it's a known service, then one can imagine that more than a handful of residents would want it. So, well, perhaps even to, you know further debilitating them because of the, uh, the their reasonable expectation that the service that we provided would be of general application and, and, and quality, where in, when in fact it doesn't appear that that would that's likely to be the case. Is that is that essentially satisfied? Yes, and the only point that hasn't been said, but I'll just throw it out to make the conversation complete. All the while this is going on, we are responding to constant crime. Yeah. We're running all over the place. Trees out, mm -hmm. powers out, mm -hmm. lion laying in my yard. We're trying to deal with DTE. We've got fire stations without power. We've got our hands full just trying to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have an extra cadre of people to pull from that to come manage these things. Mm -hmm. One, uh, yeah. Appreciate that that might just be the, the, the end of the conversation. Maybe that is the end of the conversation. I don't see the university here. University um, with power and resources, and uh, I, I don't mean like social power. I mean power, power, and resources, and lots of places for people to sleep where they'll be heat. I can mention to you that during the storm, we actually were contacted by Michigan Medicine. Uh, they had a power outage 
people with uh, new oxygen. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They, they, they asked if we could set up. They wanted us to set up a medical shelter for people with oxygen. To help them because they didn't have which one. Yeah, that seems like a pretty big issue. <laughs> well, we have to say no. But, um, you know, in the heat of the moment, you do whatever you can. So the people in ER, et cetera, were calling whoever they could call, yes. and they kept calling. When the incident was well past, I felt I had an obligation to go up the chain there and say, hey, did you know we were asked to help? And we said no, but here's why. We have zero capacity to do anything like that. But if we need to have a broader conversation about future, we're open to talking to you. So that's just what kind of a situation it was. I will say, so several university facilities along with Ann Arbor Public School uh, facilities were identified as part of the American Red Cross plan. And presumably if we got into something that was at that 72 hour window, there's actually agreements between, separate from the city, between American Red Cross and the U and between the American Red Cross and Ann Arbor Public Schools. But again, that's when the big, Full, full armada of AR, of American Red Cross resources move 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 that. Um, so, um, uh, so the university is university is there for the three day plus event. It's not there for the three six hour event. Yes, yes, and and all all of those just being familiar with those agreements. It was here's the facility. And then no no supply of staff or other support beyond the, there's the bathroom, there's the lights. It's on. Yes, it's on. Yeah. 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 What do you need from us at this point? Uh, kind of a nod if you want us to engage in financial negotiations what the price would be to pursue can. I, 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 I think I have I think the sense of room if I hear it correctly is is earnest appreciation for the work that's been done to get us here and for the um uh and a and a, a understanding that staff does not believe that this is a service that we can provide to uh to residents in a way that would meet their service expectations. Right. And so they had a truck. And so they did. Thank you. Does that warrant some kind of uh, like? No, oh. we're good. Okay. <laughs> we can go there. Uh, I mean, just like, you know, it's, it's more than just the five of us. Like, is that warranted some species of communication to counsel to let them know that? Just looked at. Yeah. I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Some sort of memo. Is a memo sufficient? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. The piece that the piece that I think that you mentioned that was also interesting is, I mean, I'm kind of curious. In, what are the resources that that folks feel like they would have needed to be in their homes for three days and be safe and secure? And what you know, what's lacking there? Because I mean, I know that I and others have. Home time and homes without heat for an extended period of time, and so I don't know if it's you know a lack of resources to have you know wool blankets or flashlights and things like that. That might there be an opportunity for us to to fill to try to fill a very um, uh, address that need in a more limited way um, when emergencies come about. That there might be an opportunity to come down to the fire station and get your blanket and flashlight um if that's something that is you know essential the essential needs or we provide a you know we negotiated some discounted rates for so i don't know i'm just wondering if there are if there's any in between ground that we might be able to better meet the community needs for folks who felt like they were in that um couldn't stay in their home situation I don't know. We can go back to that. Yeah. 
Yep. I'm finished with this evaluation. I think Ms. Bell is available. She sent you the, I believe she has summarized the evaluation. She did. And, um, we're here to answer any questions you might have about the process or the summary or provide a summary on the record if you like, and then we can have a little session for feedback after you've asked your questions. Okay, that, that, that's what you're looking for. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. Ms. Bell, welcome. Welcome. Hello. Yes, I'm looking, I know we don't have a ton of time, but I am looking forward to answering any questions about the process um, and then discussing next steps. So. Super. Um, are there any, I, I, myself, I have no questions. Are there questions all around? No, I thought the, the evaluator, the review that you gave us of the evaluation was quite helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I guess I, uh, uh, the only question I sort of had was around our own participation in the process, kind of looking at that. I couldn't quite tell. I could see the total number of participants. I wasn't sure if this was something where we had full council participation and evaluations or not. I don't know if that's necessary. I can look that up. Did I just yeah, that? That was, okay. I think I just missed that data. So it sounds like it's there and I just missed it. So nope. No need to look it up. Great. So then if you have no questions for Ms. Bell, then I would request that we go into closed session and you can provide feedback. Um, and I think Ms. Higgins has arranged for a separate room so that we can walk out of here where we go Sarah. Right next door. Okay. Right next door. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to go to closed session yes. and request the city attorney for yes. the purpose of? Um, we have Nancy within it here. Under MCLA 15.268, CD, E, and H sections. Who's five? Regina Taylor, Councilmember. Okay. Higher. Discussion? Roll call vote. Mayor Taylor. Yes. Councilmember Regina. Yes. Councilmember Watson. Yes. Councilmember Ayer. Yes. Councilmember Brayton. Yes. Closed session. Uh, so what do we have? Um, you have a motion. You have two motions. The first motion being a motion to accept the evaluation of Mr. Dehoney and to place it on the council agenda for October 16th as a recommendation to full council. Move by. Dina, great discussion. In favor? Opposed? Approved. We have a second motion to accept the evaluation for at main four and place it on the agenda for full council on October 16th with the recommendation to amend the employment agreement with the city attorney to um, give a 3% increase in her salary and a 2% one-time bonus payment. Move by. I have lots of discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Approved. Okay. Council calendar and work question. So the one question um, I have, there's been some interest expressed in having the university come here and talk about their planning process and all. I know some people go into the breakfast and see some are not able to make it. Uh, I can actually tack this on to our December 11th council planning session. Maybe the second half. If that's not agreeable, then it would be January. Because 
once you get past the 11th of December and turn into a next session, it's not going mm -hmm. out. So I don't know if there is a sense of urgency and wanting to hear from the university, they're willing to come whenever they come on over. So we would do the three city things first and then we'll take a break and then put the university up when I do it on any other. And this is specifically related to their comprehensive plan, correct? Yeah, they don't call it that, but, yeah. but yeah. yes. They're 20 It would be SUDOT and Mike Rain and whoever else they bring. Okay. From the staff's perspective, is there is there room on that agenda? Yeah, because we don't do the five hour thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. We can do it. Yeah. But it's just really your call. Sure. Yeah. You've got three things now. Um, if we didn't do it that night, then you're mid to late January before we could do it because we've learned hard less than Jan first week of January really yeah. right. people are not ready yet. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Excuse me. I'm going to build. Yep. Okay. Do you need anything for me? Nope. Okay. Um, this is just advice on a topic that has not yet gelled. If the city is going to get really take the next two or three steps as it relates to either an SMU or an MU. We need to be thinking about hiring someone in the Bill of Fire Run Utility that is not Dr. Stolz's skill set and she doesn't have the capacity to take it on. So if we need that, uh, I see the contract with somebody which would be enormously expensive hiring them and you're probably going to have to pay them way above what you pay me. And the utility is a very expensive thing and there's not a lot of folks running around who can do that. I'll just put that to you. Um, <laughs> if you're going to set up the utility, you need a person running it who has a certain skill set. But when you get the skill set that's sufficient for you to elevate to the top of the utility, you command a certain amount. You just say, I'm not going to do it if you don't pay me that. Mm -hmm. I don't know the Michigan market. I don't know the Ann Arbor market. I do know that's not the kind of skill set that 200 people have. So you're either finding a retired person who may want to take it on because it's not an actual up and running utility, or you're trying to lure somebody from somewhere else to come do it. Well, if you're going to lure somebody, you really you got to pay what they say. Um, but the, the real point I'm driving home is Dr. Stoltz does not have that skill set and relying on her to make decisions about utility startup is not something she really can do. Mm -hmm. And she knew I was going to say that to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I've had that conversation with yeah. her. Maybe this isn't the time for that conversation. I mean, we, we run a water utility. We run a, just to what extent would we have maybe not the expertise, but um, the ability within our current you know, public work infrastructure. You wouldn't have the capacity because the primary focus of Brian Steglitz has got to be the 100 plus million dollar water treatment plant. You can't this is not something you can get up every third or fourth day and do or have as number six or seven on your list. Mm -hmm. This is something that requires a dedicated effort. Uh, the MEU would be more onerous than the SEU. Um, but there's some additional analysis that you have to make a decision on. Do we go to phase two? Um, that's six figures. Um, 
we've already heard our paid consultant tell us with the utility you're not going to get to 2030 and make it because you're going to be in court for four or five years you know those kind of things um part of the reason i'm saying what i'm saying today is i have an obligation to protect the well-being of the staff and some of the folks have been just completely exhausted I mean, because we're trying to do day-to-day -day osi we're trying to get grants we're trying to do solar we're trying to do all these things um, and we're coming to work on this to date we've made it work but if we're going to take the plunge and say we're going to set a utility up dr stoltz go make that happen i'm telling you she can't do it. yeah mm -hmm. That that surprises me that one. But I mean <laughs> that's a that's a mammoth job that requires a very special uh, set of experiences. Although it, it, and while this may be a city organization cost on the upfront just because there's no ratepayer revenue, at some point that just transitions to ratepayers. Yeah. Okay. Any other upcoming business? Uh, I'll note uh, 901. Uh, is there, uh, if the caller is interested in speaking in public comment, please enter star nine now. Seeing no one, public comments closed. Uh, motion to adjourn, please. Move by. I review the discussion. All in favor? 